uh, when in our prayer meeting on Wednesday, the Lord brought a word and I shared on it this afternoon at our own meeting. And I just want to take a few things from that. Uh, the verse in particular, the Lord laid on my heart, we'll find in 2 Corinthians, and just bear with me, the light in here isn't very good, so I just hope I'll be able to read what I've put here. So in 2 Corinthians, chapter 8 and verse 9, it's a verse that I'm sure we're all familiar with. But the Lord brought it to me today, or Wednesday rather, and again today, as we've shared upon it, and thread so, threw some light on it in my own heart that I wanted to share. So from the authorised King James Version, we would read, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that in itself is an amazing statement. You know. And I wonder, in my own heart, do I know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it just a phrase on the pages of the Bible? But he, he says that, though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. I was just dwelling on, on these, and I've looked up a few of the, the Greek words, not that I want to uh, burden you with those, but the word there, poor, could be translated pauper. And you know what a pauper is. Someone is reduced to beggary. And there's a, a word I've not really come across before, which is indignance. Indignance. It's not a word I'm familiar with. And I spoke to someone else today. They said they're not really familiar with it. But looking in the English dictionary, this is what I found. A level of poverty in which real hardship and deprivation are suffered and comforts of life are wholly lacking. And that put a new light on what it meant when Jesus said, um, or Paul said rather, that through his, he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. Let me just read a couple of things to you. Being in France, um, I think it might be appropriate to quote from a lady called Madame Guillon. And this is what she had to say in writing to someone. Said, I depend on you to destroy it. That is this biography she's writing, this letter. When your soul has drawn those spiritual advantages which God intended and for which purpose I am willing to sacrifice all things. I am fully persuaded of his designs towards you as well for the sanctification of others as for your own sanctification. Let me assure you now, this is a woman who knew what it was to be ridiculed, to suffer persecution, and she was put in the Bastille for several years. She says, let me assure you, this is not attained save through pain, weariness, and labor, and it will be reached by a path that will wonderfully disappoint your expectations. And this is the bit I think is poignant. Nevertheless, if you are fully convinced that it is on the nothingness in man that God establishes his greatest works, you will 
in part be guarded against disappointment or surprise. He destroys that he might build. For when he is about to rear his sacred temple in us, he first totally raises that vain and pompous edifice which human art and power had erected, and from the horrible ruins a new structure is formed by his power alone. Now, you know, there was nothing in Christ that he could boast about. He, it was, he was poor. He was, had nowhere, as Wesley says, to lay his head. We find that in, in uh, Matthew 8. We just turn to that briefly, if you've got your Bible with you, in Matthew 8, in verse 26. Just bear with me while I find it on here. Matthew 8, 18, I believe we need to go to. It says in verse 18 of Matthew 8, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. And just thinking about that, Jesus had nothing in this life. He didn't even carry money around. He was in the eyes of the world. A nobody. And he was born into a situation where his parents would have been regarded as nobodies. They weren't rich people. His stepfather was a carpenter. Mary was someone who, she was unknown to the world, totally unknown, maybe just known in the village, in Nazareth where they lived. But she wouldn't have re been regarded as someone that has anything of any importance in the world's eyes. And just like Madame Dion was saying, if, you, if you're persuaded it's on the nothing in a man, that God builds his greatest works, his finest works. And you know, and as I've been contemplating on this, that is out, out of his poverty, out of his nothingness, out of having nothing. And you can say, well, he was the son of God. He did all his miracles. He was a wonderful person. He raised the dead, he healed the sick. But Jesus in himself was nothing. He said without his father, he could do nothing. And out of that poverty, that we are made rich. It's not out of something else, out of his poverty. What a wonderful thing. And I don't want to go into the, the fact of, of richness and all that we have in Christ, because we have so much. But it, Christ, you know, he, we, we read, don't we, in Philippians, that being in the form of God, he didn't consider it to be anything, but he emptied himself. And we see as we read in Philippians, he goes down and down and down, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And as I've been thinking of these things today, and it's absolutely amazing. That I want to look at that word which I did, had struggled struggle to pronounce because it's new to me. Um, 
I'll try and pronounce it correctly, I think indigence, a level of poverty in which real hardship and deprivation are suffered and comforts of life are wholly lacking. Jesus had none of the things that we take for granted. He was born into a situation, into a life, he, as you know, he was laid in the manger, in a stable or a cave, whatever it was, it, it's irrelevant. But what it was, that he came with nothing. He came as nothing. And, and beloved, my friend, you know, that's, that's the Jesus that saved us out of his poverty. He's made us rich. And I just want to say, I don't want to, I could spend a lot of time, but I want to give John the opportunity to speak. As I've been thinking about in the last few days, I thought, Lord, is that me? Am I like that? Is that what, is that what the Jesus is like in me? Do I know this Jesus? This, this state of, of, you know, Paul, let's look in Philippians, that very famous um, scripture. Um, I've quoted Philippians already, but let's look into chapter three of Philippians and how Paul understood what it was to, to be in Christ. And let me just find it a moment. Philippians chapter 3. He, he, he said that I have doubtless, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And as we read in the authorised version, and do count them but dung. For what reason? That I may win Christ. That was his sole objective. He had, we know when we could read before, what Paul possessed. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he was a, a true Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. And yet he says, I only want to know Christ. I want to win Christ. I want this man who's out of whose poverty I made rich. Isn't that wonderful? Out of his poverty. Did, did, uh, I don't know, have we understood Jesus like this? Have I understood Jesus like this? It was out of the nothing. It was out of the emptiness. It was out of, he never thought of himself as being anything. Never. He never had an ego. He never thought, oh, aren't I wonderful? I'm the son of God. No, quite the opposite. He made himself of no reputation. And do I want to be like that? I want to say I do. I want to be just like that. I want to know the reality of it, not just what's written in a book. I want to know this, this Jesus, that I might win him. In, and Paul had to lose everything. And we do as well. We have to lose our reputation. We need to, as I'm sure you know, and, and I'm sure you've heard these things before, but he suffered the loss of all things. Wesley says, a suffering life my master led. So, I'm not saying we should, you know, look to, for suffering. I don't believe we should do that. But it will cost us everything that I might win him. Or as he says further down, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, being conformed unto his death. So I just want to leave that really. It's very short, it's just a few minutes, but it's out of his poverty that you and I are made rich. Amen. 
Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you pay, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hand. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the treasure of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hand. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the treasure of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Worthy is the Lord.